Good morning, my name is Kanan Parker. I'm one of the pastors here at Pillar Church. And as always, it's a joy and an honor. Y'all can still, I'm good? Okay. Uh, it's always a joy and an honor to be able to open up God's word with you. We're gonna be continuing in our series in the book of Jude called Contending for the Faith. So go ahead and open there to the book of Jude in your copy of God's word. Where I'm from, getting caught up is a regular occurrence. There are brothers from my neighborhood who had just come home from doing a bid in jail. And after they come home, they look for a job that, play, that pays decent wages. But once they, they, can't, they can't find a job that pays decent wages, and so they find themselves getting caught up back in the drug game or in the gun game. Teenagers tend to get caught up trying to build and keep reputations, trying to be a tough guy, trying to be a player. Alcoholics tend to get caught up when circumstances get really difficult. Husbands and wives tend to get caught up in pornography when there's marital relational issues. Y'all feel me? This, this hitting home? Y'all know anybody who tends to get caught up in these ways? Elementary school kids tend to get caught up trying to impress their friends. Religious folk tend to get caught up trying to earn their way to God and earn favor before God. There's a singular thread running through all of those examples of being caught up. Can y'all find and figure out what that common thread may be? What's the common thread between all of those examples? That wasn't rhetorical. Y'all can talk to me. And I'll just say you're wrong in front of everybody. The common thread. Did, did he just guess? The common thread is that their eyes are fixed on something other than Jesus. See, when you chase things other than Jesus, it's like you're chasing the wind until you find a hurricane. It's like you're chasing the smoke until you find, until you find the fire. It's an all-consuming race to a never-ending finish line. You see, when your eyes are fixed on Jesus, your feet are able to clear such obstacles because you're not focused on the circumstance before you. You're focused on the God who's sovereign over the circumstance. When you fix your eyes on Jesus and not on yourself, you remain steadfast and immovable in the midst of false doctrine and false teachers because Jesus is the source and the perfecter of our faith. You find that in your cross-reference sheet, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And if we stand upon the rock of Christ, we will never be shaken. And so that asks the question, it begs the question, Pastor Canaan, how come I find myself slipping? How come I find myself getting caught up? How come I find myself tripping over myself? So let me ask you a question, beloved. If you find yourself slipping, if you find yourself getting caught up from time to time, if you find yourself allowing your circumstances to dictate your mood, your actions, and your decisions, who do you think is the is the apple of your eye. Who do you think your eye is fixed on during that time? Your eye is fixed on yourself. I want you to take a moment and to consider what's the thing that causes you to get caught up? What's that, that they call it that sin that easily besets? What's that sin that easily besets you? I want you to really think about what that is. I don't want you to come here, say, yeah, that's sin, and then leave. What's that sin that easily besets you? Is it anger? Are you short with your family? Are you not being able to keep your eyes pure? Is it alcohol? Is it pride? What is it for you? Think about it. Consider it. Is it worry? Here in the book of Jude, there are false teachers who have infiltrated the church. And they're infiltrating and leading and influencing the people of God away from him. We call them wolves. There are people who are doing harm to the sheep for personal gain. People who will entice your eyes away from Jesus into following them, their movement, and eventually your desires over Jesus' desires. Teachings of wolves will get you caught up. Do y'all know of a wolf? 
this morning. Do you guys know anybody who's trying to influence you toward something other than Jesus? Somebody who's trying to get you to put your faith in something other than Jesus. Maybe it's not somebody who's trying to hurt you for their own personal gain or for their own personal movement. Maybe it's somebody you know who's been influenced by a wolf. Someone who points you to things other than intimacy with Christ. Somebody who lifts up something higher than the gospel of Jesus. Y'all don't have any people like that in your lives? Any people like that at your workplace? Any people like that at the barbershop? This morning, we're going to consider Jude verse 16. And Jude and I, as your pastor, want to call you to beware of the snare and the temptation to do life apart from Christ. Look at Jude verse 16 in your copy of God's word. We read out the CSB version here. It said these people, these wolves, are discontented grumblers living according to their own desires. Their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people to their own advantage. Let's explain and dissect that a little bit and see if we're able to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus in the midst of it. The first thing that it says in verse 16 is that these people are discontented grumblers. You ever heard the, you ever heard the phrase misery loves company? Come on, y'all. Y'all got to nod your head of some. Y'all ever heard the phrase misery loves company? Just so y'all know, like y'all can talk to the kid. I'm personable. I like you. You like me. Come on. Y'all can talk. These false teachers, well, Misery Loves Club's company, that's precisely what we're seeing in the book of Jude. These false teachers are not satisfied with Jesus, and they want to lead you to not be satisfied in Jesus as well. You see, a false teacher thinks that they'll find satisfaction in you finding satisfaction in them. Y'all heard that? Let me say that again. A false teacher thinks that they will find satisfaction in your finding satisfaction in them. You know what's crazy? Most of us think just like a false teacher, don't we? Because most of us find our satisfaction in other people finding their satisfaction in us. And we know that because we can't sleep when somebody dares has a problem with us. When someone dare disagree with us, we're all caught up. We're in our feelings, we're in our emotions. We find our identity and our satisfaction in other people's approval of us. Well, that's what these wolves are influencing the church that Jude is writing to to do. And I have a feeling that it's even infiltrated our own American heart and mind today. We think that we're gonna find satisfaction in life when others find satisfaction in us. And so we allow people, ooh, listen to this. So we allow people to manipulate us and flatter us into following them instead of following Jesus because somewhere deep inside, we think that we can satisfy each other's deepest longing, longings and desires. You know, that's where a lot of husband and wives get in trouble when they try to find satisfaction in their spouse rather than satisfaction in Jesus. And then when their spouse lets them down, they're all caught up in their feelings. It's nice that your spouse wants to satisfy you. But ultimately, your satisfaction comes from the father of lights. It comes from the son. It comes from the spirit almighty. God is the one who gives you satisfaction in this life. That's how a lot of fights start at home. And so if you find yourself in that situation where you're having marital issues, I want you to think, are you trying to find satisfaction in your spouse? Or are you trying to find satisfaction in Jesus, which is going to influence how you interact and receive from your spouse. We're going to talk more about how they manipulate and flatter in, in a little bit later in this verse. But what I'm getting at is that we seek satisfaction in things that never satisfy, and then we blame God that we're not fulfilled. They're discontent grumblers, and discontentment is birthed out of a lack of satisfaction. And in the context of this passage, these false teachers are not satisfied with God, and they're leading us to be the same. It's like when you eat a meal, you ever, (laughs) so the other day I ate a meal at the house and it was good, you know, but you ever eat that meal and then like 30 minutes later, you ruffling through the cupboard, looking for something. I know I talk about food a lot. Y'all listen to Pillars past sermons, it's all about food. You know why? Because your boy loves some food. But you ever had that meal, you eat that food, you're good, then 30, 40 minutes later, you in the cupboard looking around because whatever you hit didn't quite hit, whatever you ate didn't quite hit. You're kind of like, man, I just need a little something extra, something to put the icing on the cake. We're not quite. <laughs> yeah, RJ was like, yeah, dog. Yeah, yeah, I feel you. Yeah. 
the problem in our spiritually is that there's nothing that quite satisfies like the Lord satisfies. We need to be satisfied in an, in an, in an eternal way by the eternal one. Proverbs, look at your cross-reference sheet. Proverbs 27, 20 says, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied and people's eyes are in like manner never satisfied. But what did Jesus say as it comes to our satisfaction? Jesus said in John 6, 35, look at what he says. He said, I am the what? The bread of life. See, Jesus like talking about food too. I ain't alone. He said, I'm the bread of life. And then look what he says. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. There's no searching in the cabinet after you've partaken of the Lord. You're done. You're satisfied. You're good. I'm the bread. Whoever partakes of me, you're never hungry again. But if you want to nitpick over words and say, well, what about you being thirsty? He goes ahead and says that too. No one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. You're satisfied. You're quenched. You're good. You're good despite your circumstances because you've been able to partake of living water, of the bread of life. Guys, you find, or this is why you find discontentment and grumbling. This is why you find yourself caught up. That may be the reason why you find yourself far away from God or found yourself away from God's people because you've tried church. It's because you've tried discipline. It's because you tried accountability. But what, I've, what, I've, what have we been talking about every single week in a, in a nuanced way? Because I think that's what, what Jude is pointing us to, that Sunday service, discipline, and accountability are good and godly things. Do them, but they don't satisfy your soul. The only thing that satisfies your soul is a holy proximity to who? To Jesus. It's like finding your satisfaction in your spouse. It's the wrong place. And so you find yourself unsatisfied, unquenched. And so we come as a body of believers together and we think that in it we're going to be satisfied. But if you're devoid of a relationship with Christ, you are wholly disappointed and dissatisfied in the gathering of the people. And so you find yourself separated from the people, which is even a worse place to be. You tried to fight that, that sin that easily besets you with accountability, didn't you? Did it work? You tried to fight it with discipline, didn't you? You set a timer to get up and do it, right? You put that thing on your phone so you couldn't look at You did all that. You found a way around it, didn't you? Guys, I, sp I ain't speaking out of school. I'm speaking out of experience. I've had things in my life that have had grips and, 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 and shackles around my wrists. Sinful actions. And I put software on my computer and software on my phone. Y'all y'all see what I'm talking about, right? We got kiddos. Y'all know what I'm talking about, though, right? You do all that, but what do you do? You find a way around it. Why? Because your desire is to be satisfied. And you think that you're going to find it in that thing that you're chasing. But then after you're done, you find yourself woefully disappointed. Am I the only one? Only a holy proximity to Jesus can satisfy only being close to the Savior can do that. Loving him and pursuing him. This is what it looks like. It's like loving him and pursuing him the same way you pursue your spouse. The same, you, loving him and pursuing him the same way you pursued that job opportunity or that career path that you're on. Remember how hard you studied at school? Remember how, how diligently you put them eyes to them books? Why? Because you had an end goal in mind. And if your end goal is to know and love Jesus, oh, how does that influence your day-to-day -day activities? How does that influence your prayer when you refuse to get off your knees until you've encountered the God of heaven and earth? It changes everything when you want to be satisfied in him. You pursue him like that house you want to buy. Every moment you're on the phone finding a new one, finding a new one, I know I'm doing it. Pursue him like you need air and you're underwater. That's how you get holy proximity to Jesus. It's not a formula. It's a transformation of the heart. You want him. You want him and you want to do anything to get to him. It's a desperate desire to be close to the Savior is what you need. You, 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 you just have to call on him. You got to look to him. You got to go to him. You may be unsatisfied because you may have never truly drunk from the fountain of living water or you may be unsatisfied because you find yourself far from God right now but guys I need you to notice when you get Jesus you get God when you get Jesus you get like <laughs> y'all don't even know y'all know God you get God the creator of heaven and earth the ground you stand on was spoken by his lips 
The air you breathe, your heart beating by itself. I don't care what he, mechanisms he put in your mind to keep things beating beyond your consciousness. He created all that. You get him. You get to be with him. I'm so jacked up because I want so many other things. But if I took time to really weigh out, man, do I want, do I want this? Or do I want the creator of heaven and earth? Do I want this? Or do I want the one who's blessed me beyond what I deserve nor could have imagined? You're all breathing here under your own power. I see no ventilation systems. You walked here, most of you. You can feel your phalanges work. You got eyes, you got ears, you're hearing, you're seeing. None of this you deserve. But you get the one who gives good gifts. Jesus is better than whatever synthetic method you have to satisfy your own soul. He's just better than that. And you know because you felt the emptiness of trying to satisfy your own soul. Look what Paul said about the satisfaction of, of knowing God, of knowing Christ in Philippians chapter 3. It's in your cross-reference sheet. He said, more than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value. The surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's everything for him. Nothing else matters or is beyond the surpassing value of knowing Jesus. That's what Paul wants. That's all he desires. Because because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may what gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness based on faith. Then look at his goal. Y'all see his goal. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Jesus said, come to me, Matthew 11. He said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, all who are discontent and grumbling, and he will give you rest. Pillar Church, all of you under the sound of my voice, I'm, 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 I'm encouraging you, I'm imploring you, find your satisfaction in him alone. Don't go anywhere else for it. You won't find it. You'll be woefully disappointed. I have nothing to tell you but that. Find your satisfaction in him. You've tried it. Don't tell me you didn't try it. You tried it in other things. You find yourself in this vicious cycle of trying to find it again and again and again. But if you come to him, bended need and broken, he will give you rest. In the midst of this discontentment, these false teachers also indulge and they lead you to want to indulge in your own desires. Look at Jude 16 again. It says that they live according to their own desires. Now, to be clear, not every desire that we have is a sinful desire, but the context is making, the, making that word very precise here as to why it's a characteristic of a false teacher. Look at it again. Whose desire are they following and wanting to influence you to desire? Whose desires? Your desires or their desires, right? You know, we go through most of our life trying to satisfy our own desires. We live by our own desires. And most of the time, our own desires become idols and we find ourselves getting caught up. Sometimes what we want is of such great value that we're willing to disregard God's will, God's desires, and perhaps even sin against God and others in order to get it. Do y'all have anything in your life that you're willing to disregard God and sin against God and others in order to acquire it? Parents, let me ask you this question. You ever want quiet in your house so long that you had angry outbursts at your children? Come on now. I'll be the first one. Yeah. It's only a matter of time, Caleb. You ever want to fit in so bad that you partake of carousing and activities that are that are that are just kind of ratchet? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Someone else ever get your shine? Something that you did and they got the credit for it. And so you found yourself chasing selfish ambition and you caused strife between you and that person. Y'all know I'm only quoting Galatians chapter three, verse 19 through 21, right? I ain't make that stuff up on my own. I ain't good enough. The text just happens to say all of these different types of sins. 
that we tend to chase and desire in contrast to walking in the fruits of the Spirit. You see, our desires is what leads us to works of the flesh over against works of the Spirit. When we want what we want above what God desires for us, then we'll find ourselves walking in the flesh. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. Look what James says about it in James chapter 1, verse 14 through 15, about chasing our own desires. He says, but each person is tempted. It's in your sheet. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away. Now, remember, they're being drawn away from something. What do you think that something is? They're being drawn away from Christ. When they're drawn away and what? Enticed. What does that mean? Somebody's trying to influence you. Something is influencing you. They're drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Think about it. Who's drawing you away from proximity to Jesus? You. Your flesh. The desires of your flesh draw you away from proximity to Jesus. Verse 15. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. See, a common problem that we all have is that we don't know God's will. How many of y'all know God's will perfectly? Right. I was hoping if y'all raise your hands, I'm like, ooh. We got a long way to go, bro. We got a long way to go. See, the problem is many of us are trying to figure out what God's will is. And when we don't know God's will, what do we substitute his will for? Your will. When you don't know God's will, you substitute it for your will. Now, the question is, well, how do you do anything at that point? Like, if you don't know what God wants, but you got to make a move, you got to make a move, right? And so the, the, the reality is, if you're drawing ever closer to Jesus, if, if, you're drawing, if you're in holy proximity to him, you've developed more of the mind of Christ. But the, I want to take a little bit of mystery out of it. If you're walking in the spirit and you're, you're finding yourself in, in, in holy communion with God, when you come to a point of not knowing what to do, you do what you want because your mind has been transformed by his spirit. But if you find yourself distant from God and desiring to get closer to him and you find yourself in a position of not knowing what to do, first, very practical, you find yourself on your knees about the particular situation, right? First, you pray. That's very ABC basic. And I know that's many of us because that's me oftentimes. First, you find yourself on your knees. You pray and then you search the scriptures to see if anything that you desire is contrary to a biblical principle. Ask yourself Philippians 2 verses 3 through 4 questions. I put that in your sheet, too. Is what I'm about to do based out of selfish ambition? Is this, am I doing what I'm doing in humility and service to others? Is this desire reasonable, healthy for me and for those around me? Is my goal chasing my own desire and is chasing this desire going to get me caught up? Guys, I want you to be sure to bring your desires to the Lord, but I want you to hold your desires with an open hand. Take the example from Christ, Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Peep how he brings his desire to, the Lord, to, to God the Father, but he does so with an open hand. Look what he says. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Then look what he says. This is Jesus' desire. Y'all, I don't know if you ever read this. Y'all read this, but you don't be using it. Take, up, take this cup away from me. Y'all hear what Jesus said? I don't want to do it. He's in the garden. He's praying. He's sweating blood. It's called homo. Tri uh, what's it called? Homodridosis, I believe it's called. When you're sweating blood, blood capillaries bust in your in, in, in your in your anyway. Hemodridosis, hemodridosis. What did I say? I said something else. Look what he said. He said, take this cup away from me. What is Jesus doing? He's letting his will be known. Right? I don't want to do this. But then what did he say with the open hand? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This is the approach we take in prayer with God. We give him how we feel. We give him what we do. Don't do God. I don't want to do this. No, please. I, or I, yes, I want this, please. But at the end of the day, you will hold it with an open hand. And you say, Lord, not my will. Fine. Yours be done. Hold your desires with an open hand and you'll watch and, and you'll see God moving in and through you and in and through others to your benefit, to your good, and to the benefit of others, of others. But when you idolize your desires and you hold them with a closed hand, you end up following your heart. And your heart will always lead you astray. If anybody ever tells you to follow your heart, question that joint. 
because Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says that the heart is more deceitful than anything. I don't want you following your heart. I want you following God's word. I want you following what his desire for you. It says that the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? But Psalm 128 says, blessed is the one who walks in the ways of the Lord. Something else that's true of these false teachers, and it's very true of us as well, is that we want pe- people to think much of us. And I think this is true for all of you. All of you want other people, the people around you even, to think much of you, to desire or want much of you. You ever been in a small group? You ever been in a small group of people and you felt this, you felt this need to, to prove yourself to them? You felt your need to be extra knowledgeable? I know this ain't just me. You felt this need to be extra knowledgeable, to be extra spiritual, to be extra pious, to be extra black, to be extra woke, to be extra conservative, to be extra liberal, to be extra political, to be extra patriotic, to be extra whatever it is. You ever find yourself being influenced by the winds and the waves of the people in the group with you? I know it ain't just me. So what do you do? You change your tone a little bit. You walk a little different. You throw that $2 word you looked up in a dictionary around like you knew that for, for, for years. You start talking about history like you have some kind of real authority and grasp of it, but it's something you learned from CNN two days ago. Right? All why? Why do we do this? Because we are trying to find our satisfaction in somebody else's approval of us. We're caring what nobody else thinks. What does God think? Sometimes we do it to fit in. Sometimes we do it to impress. These false teachers are doing it in order to sway people to follow them instead of following Jesus. That's what they do. That's how that's the pressure they put on you. False teachers will flatter you to make you feel exclusive, make you feel better, make you feel deserving. False teachers are flattering people into movements that elevates things other than Jesus. They elevate external appearances. They elevate social and political platforms and allegiances. They elevate they elevate ethnic superiority and genealogies. Listen to this. They'll call things conspiracies out of fear and will appeal to your ethnicity or your social political allegiance and the evils of others to draw you away with big and lofty words. But the text tells us in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12, don't believe all the conspiracies that those are calling and saying are conspiracies. Don't follow them and don't fear what they fear. That's not in your sheet. You can write it in Isaiah 8, 12. They call things conspiracies out of fear and appear appeal to your ethnicity, social and political allegiances and evils of others to draw you away with big and lofty words. You don't think I'm I'm getting this from the text? It's in Jude 16. It says their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. They speak uh, that word arrogant. It means bombastic. It means uh, high sounding words with with a whole lot of different uh, conjunctions in them that are inflated, yet they're hollow. Y'all know anybody like that that's coming trying to, to influence you to something other than Jesus? Look what, Tim, look what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4. It says, for the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Whose desires is, uh, are they going to go, go to? It? What are they going to do? That's the definition of flattery. I'm going to do whatever it takes in order to win you. I'm going to win your mind. I'm going to win your heart. Not with the objective truth of God or his word. I'm not trying to win you to me. I'm not trying to win you to my movement. Listen, if I ain't ever told y'all none of this, I don't care if you come to Pillar. I want you closer to Jesus. It's not our own advantage we desire. We desire that the kingdom of God be expanded. But false teachers, what are they doing? They're going to try to lure you for their own benefit. Second Timothy 4 says, For the time will come when people will not, salarate, will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they, because they have itching ears that he, uh, they, they have ears that itch. And to hear what they want to hear. Verse four, they will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. Romans 16, 18. It says such people do not serve the Lord Jesus, but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. Y'all know flattery is one of the most grievous evils in the world. Flattery is horrible. Flattery is when Someone tells you what you want to hear in order to gain flavor and influence with you. But I want you to beware of flattery. When somebody's talking too good about you, 
too well about you, I want you to look at Proverbs 29.5. A person who flatters his neighbor spreads a, feet, spreads a net under his feet. Pillar Church, if anyone is seeking to lift anything on par or more than Jesus, don't follow that man, woman, or teaching. Don't do it. Jude is telling you to. I'm telling you, don't follow that. Don't follow them. Don't follow it. Don't follow him. Don't follow me. If I am leading you to anything other than Jesus, I lead you astray. Remember a few weeks ago, it says that they're wandering stars. If you try to, you remember astro navigation, when you're navigating because of the, the celestial beings in the sky, and if there's a moving star, it's leading you to nothing. It has no aim. You find yourself lost. That's why Paul said, if I or anybody else that claims to be a messenger of Christ preaches anything but Christ to you, let him be accursed. Temporary is the satisfaction of placing your faith in anything but Jesus. Powerless is the salvation of placing your hope in anything but Jesus. The only thing that needs to be lifted up high. Listen, the only thing that we need as, a, as the people of God, hear me. The only thing you need to lift up high is Jesus upon the cross. That's it. John 3, verse 14 and 15. See, y'all know John 3, 16, right? What about the verses before? Just as Moses was lifted, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Don't get caught up in the, flat, in the flattery of men who tell you that you're something special. My friends, we're all equal at the foot of the cross. You're equally as sinful as the one sitting next to you. Yes, you may be different. Yes, you, miss, you may be unique, my friend, but you're not better than anybody. Don't get caught up in over loyalty to partisan politics and ideologies. My friends, look around. You probably have a different political position than the person sitting 20 feet away from you. But you dare not lift that political position up, not higher than Jesus. There's unity under the banner of Christ. You better not put too much stock in the, in the, in the melanin within your skin or the lack thereof. Because at the end of the day, we all bleed red. We're all equal at the foot of the cross, dog. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. Scientifically, our differences end at the flesh. at skin deep. Don't find your satisfaction in the opinions of others and just find yourself getting caught up. That's how you allow man to be God rather than God being God. Don't get caught up trying to be something that you're not. Don't get caught up in the desires of your heart. Don't get caught up by big bombastic words and lofty speech. Don't get caught up with, from the homies around the block that's trying, to, that's trying to influence you to do dirt for them so they don't get caught up. That's my story. Oh, we're going to show you some love, bro. Yeah, why don't you move this weight for me? Who gets caught? Who gets in trouble? And then if you snitch, you, you a clown because you don't want to go to jail because you got somebody you want to feed. This whole hood life so backwards, y'all. Just think about it. I want you to take some lenses and look at it. It's backward. It's another sermon, another day. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Let Jesus be the lens that you see the world through. Fix your eyes on Jesus, who is lifted up for the salvation of all those who believe. When you find yourself in the storms of life and you're slipping and tripping, I want you to fix your eyes on one place only, and that's not your spouse. Don't look at your spouse for stability because they're tripping and slipping too. I want you to fix your eyes on Christ when your heart is broken and you are confused. Don't follow your desires, but fix your eyes on, upon the foot of the cross and ask God to transform your soul and your heart. If you feel the temptation to sin, fix your eyes on Christ. That's the only way I've been able to combat sin is by focusing on Jesus and less on myself or on the sin. If y'all are struggling with sin, don't focus on the sin. I don't know if you ever heard that, right? So I'm going to focus, you know, put on my, don't focus on the sin, focus on the Savior. Fix your eyes on Jesus when you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. A false teacher is going to have you looking through unbiblical lenses at all kinds of things, twist, twisting truth and calling it straight and leading people to make judgment calls apart from the reality of what God's will would be for you. My friends, ha never have anything to do with that. But fix your eyes on Jesus, for there is no other name given under heaven, given among men by which we must be saved. And that statement isn't just an eternal saving. It's saving now. 
You want to be a benefit to your community? Fix your eyes upon Christ and act as he would have you act. You want to bless the individuals in your community? Fix your eyes upon Christ and do what he, have, do what he would have you to do. He already told you what to do. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know what to do, but your desire says no. Who's leading you away from God's will? You. But if you fix your eyes on Christ and stop worrying about what somebody else is going to think about you, just maybe we'll walk in accordance with what he desires. And then just maybe we'll have the satisfaction of leading others and leading ourselves closer to the Savior. And that satisfaction is better than anything you could have came up with on your own. There's no other name given among heaven by which we must be saved. Listen to the words of Jude 16 again. These people are discontent grumblers. Why? Because they haven't found their satisfaction in Christ. They live according to their own desires. Why? Because they haven't su submitted to the desires of Christ. Their mouths, uh, their mouths utter arrogant words. Why? Because they find their satisfaction in others finding their satisfaction in them. And they flatter people to their own advantage. They're selfish and they want to use you. My friend, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and let nobody other than him satisfy the, the, the desires of your soul. Amen. Father, oftentimes we find inadequate satisfaction in things that don't truly satisfy. It happens all the time, Lord, where we're placing our faith in men. We're placing our faith in our abilities to keep certain laws and certain dietary restrictions. But you say in Colossians chapter two that we need not put our, our focus in these things because they're only a shadow of the substance. And if we're in the substance, then we're good. That means that we're in the substance who is Christ. Then we find our satisfaction and our wholeness and our identity tied up and bound up in the risen Savior rather than in man's opinion. But Lord, so often we find ourselves bound to these things. Even among us here, we're bound to these things. Would you set us free? Would you visit a bunch of people who don't deserve your presence today? Would you surprise us by your grace? Would you give us the power to love our neighbors? Would you call us to holiness, gentleness, and truth? And would you allow the only opinion that matters be yours? Lord, we love you and we're grateful for you. And we thank you in the name of Christ. Amen.